So hi everyone, welcome to the Space Science Series, the Center for Space Science, in with the UAE Space Agency. Uh, today I am delighted to introduce Professor uh, P. Srikumar. Uh, he is the Satish Dhawan Professor at ISRO. Uh, he is the former director of uh, Space Science Program Office there. Uh, he was one of the main people behind establishing the space science instrumentation facility at the ISRO Satellite Center. He started there as uh, the head of the Space Astronomy Group. He has been involved with a number of space missions such as AstroSat, GSAT-2, India's lunar missions, Chandrayaan-1 and 2, as a PI and co-PI uh, on multiple instruments. He has also served as the director of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bengaluru. In the early part of his career, he spent uh, about a decade at NASA Goddard working on gamma ray astronomy missions. Uh, today, uh, he will tell us about ISRO's future endeavors. So, Professor Sri Kumar, welcome to our center, welcome to NYU Abu Dhabi. We are eager to learn about ISRO's missions. And now I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of this discussion here today. Uh, I hope you can hear me all. Is it my loud and clear? Yep. All right. Okay. So today I will try to briefly summarize some level uh, the space science program that ISRO is involved in. Um, a little bit of introduction, maybe talk about what we are currently involved in, and then I'll move on to what we believe may be some possible missions that are coming up in the next decade. And I've set it under consideration because these are, as you can imagine, um, we go through a long process of actually uh, evolving the mission until we make a final decision on this. So many of them are in the, in the works and not necessarily confirmed missions as of now. So let me begin with uh, just a quick summary of what I mean by space sciences. See, we broadly break it into planetary sciences atmospheric sciences, which really focus on Earth, astronomy, astrophysics, and in the last decade or so, we've been actually getting into what I call as other, which will now have greater in, in interest with regard to both biology in space, as well as the human space component, because ISRO is involved in a human space program, and at the same time, catering to uh, research in fundamental sciences and material sciences, et cetera, that are all related to uh, the availability of a microgravity platform which comes with as part of our human space program uh, activity. So this is a growing area, but broadly we have these. And today, given the limited time, I thought I'll just focus largely on planetary sciences and astronomy and astrophysics. So let me begin with a discussion about our current planetary exploration program. It's about a decade old since we started our first mission to the moon. And then we had an interim, uh, an initial mission to Mars. So the lunar planetary, uh, the, the planetary program of ours is largely driven by about a, a 10 years ago, we had the first mission Chandrayaan-1. Uh, interestingly, this was a mission where we had a fair number of international partners. We had actually a call, an of opportunity call for contribution from international partners, uh, NASA, ESA, and many of the European collaborators actually did uh, submit uh, proposals and we did have a fair number of them on our first mission very interesting and very fruitful program from that perspective. It was a rather short-lived mission. It had about nine month duration. We followed that up with a Chandrayaan-2, which is currently in orbit. It had three components, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Uh, September last year, we were supposed to land, soft land on it. Unfortunately, we had a hard landing. And we're gonna to attempt to really come back to that uh, with the closure of uh, Chandrayaan-3, which would carry a lander and rover nearly similar to what was there on Chandrayaan 2 and which we hope will be up there in 21. Looking beyond the, these two missions is a mission that uh, I'll come to later, uh, something that we're trying to collaborate with our Japanese colleagues on a polar lander. Just to summarize a few important things about the Chandrayaan 2 mission, primarily from the orbiter. Orbiter carries about eight payloads. Some of them are sort of follow up to what we had uh, from Chandrayaan 1. It's an orbiter that has a polar orbit, 100 kilometers polar orbit, primarily used for mapping the surface of the moon, uh, both in terms of uh, topography mapping, in terms of chemical mapping, in terms of mineralogy mapping, uh, subsurface mapping using radars, 
And so we have, we carry optical imaging uh, cameras on board. This is a ter terrain map camera, which attempts to desire to, uh, to complete a full digital elevation model uh, of the moon, um, better than what we what is currently available is so hope. And it also carries a very high resolution camera, the which a high resolution camera, which has a resolution that is, uh, you know, uh, practical better than what is what is currently available on La Road. Uh, but clearly, with such high resolution, you get a very small swath, so you are not able to cover the full moon. But very important if you want to study specific regions of the moon. We also have an infrared spectroscopy uh, spectrometer, which actually using the one to five micron band does both mineral identification, and as well as scout for the very important detection of water. Uh, with Chandrayaan-1, we had some initial uh, efforts to look for this uh, water signature, and our goal was to really improve upon that, and that is an infrared spectrometer that we have. And at subsurface, as I mentioned earlier, we have a dual frequency synthetic aperture radar, which are, of course, excellent to really look below the surface. And in particular, look for scattering that could arise from the presence of water ice, uh, below the surface. In the area of surface chemistry, which also adds to the, uh, the compositional studies of the moon, we have an X-ray spectrometer, which is actually a, uh, a, a scaled version of what we had uh, in Chandrayaan-1, but fully made within the country. The earlier one was a collaboration with Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in UK. Because it's a, it's a fluorescence mission, it, it waits for the sun to really uh, emit X-rays, which of course happens best during solar flares. So we have a, an X-ray sky monitor, solar monitor on board, which is always looking at the sun. And that in turn tells us, tell us when a flare happens and when the flare happens, the spectrum of the sun, uh, of the X-rays that are falling on the surface of the moon is constantly monitored using X-ray samples. With that input, it is not difficult for us to then look at the fluorescence that you'd expect to see nearly simultaneously from the lunar orbit using the class spectrometer experiment. And uh, we're right now seeing excellent uh, results from this class spectrometer experiment. The advantage of a, an X-ray spectrometer is to really, you can actually identify chemical elements directly and is quantifiable if you have a fairly good uh, calibration of the spectrometer. And so we believe this combination of uh, an X-ray monitor along with the um, X-ray detector would actually provide a fairly useful input on chemistry. Only um, a limitation we currently have is because these are X-rays and the signal is found very faint, it is not easy to get the kind of spatial resolution that you can you do, like to have alongside the mineralogy map. But we've been making strides with regard to bringing it down to a few kilometers, 10 kilometer scales. And that's a significant improvement of what has been done in the past. Looking above the surface of the moon, we have exospheric, uh, the thin atmosphere that exists, uh, where we look for mass spectrometer, which is chase two, look for chemical molecules of various types and their uh, time dependence and position dependence with regard to as measured from the orbit. And we also have a uh, use a spacecraft uh, communication system to do radio occultation studies from ground using ground-based uh, uh, receivers to look at uh, uh, presence of uh, changing of, of open environments that actually influence the refractive index around the moon. So in case there are dust layers, so that in principle one can actually see this. So this is primarily the scope, the, the, the suit of instruments we're now currently operating around the moon. And here is, for example, an image from the uh, orbiting high resolution camera, very high resolution, as I said, these are really individual pixels at the level of 30 centimeters. And you can actually see fine boulders in it. And this is very important to look for small craters, looking at crater size distribution at low, at small sizes and so on. And uh, we hope to be able to use this to do a lot of interesting science. Here's another uh, picture from that where you can see on the right-hand side, uh, efforts to identify boulders and boulder size distribution, which is an important thing both for uh, lunar science as well as for future landing operations in case we need to do it. The synthetic aperture radar is actually both in S and L band. An L band would at uh, 1.5 gigahertz would actually allow deeper penetration of the, of the beam and hence you can actually see the subsurface a little bit further. And uh, given the fact that the radar reflectance from such a synthetic aperture radar 
is quite heavily driven by presence of water rise, which produces bright reflections, but then you also have to worry about how roughness also produces a lot of scattering and uh, how the, uh, the refractive index, uh, the dielectric constant of the medium of the surface also could actually influence a reflector. So using a dual frequency synthetic aperture radar with full polarimetric mode actually allows us to make some very distinct uh, measurements that actually would prevent some of the ambiguity that existed in the earlier SAR. Here in this middle panel, what you see are three uh, craters that are actually below the surface. You wouldn't see that uh, if you were to take a visual, visual image, but you see it because of the fact that the roughness of these hidden craters, which have been buried by regolith subsequently, are showing up in these enhanced reflectors that you see at these frequencies. There's a very interesting um, uh, probes for subsurface features. But the most interesting thing we really want to look for is the fact that can we really look for large deposits of uh, eyes at the poles and we're starting to see important signals from that direction. So the evidence for lunar water, which is clearly a very important thing at this stage in uh, global planetary exploration is, uh, was a large extent given by this M cubed uh, moon mineralogy mapper payload that was on Chandrayaan-1. And uh, it was also had inputs from the synthetic aperture radar that was carried on Chandrayaan-1. Um, and there was, uh, you know, very recently, about a few years ago, there was this discussion of looking at uh, uh, faint indications of water, not from the IR reflectance, but from the fact that you're actually seeing scattered light of the permanently shadowed regions near the poles uh, has raised a lot of interest uh, with regard to presence of water at the poles. But the synthetic aperture radar images already showed the presence of water as seen from the SAR images from many missions. But the problem with the infrared uh, data was often the fact that the, infrared, the initial infrared data in the cube only went up to three microns or so. And in the three micron band, what you see is not the full absorption spectrum of uh, water, but rather a part of the absorption spectrum. Further, this absorption spectrum is, uh, is sort of um, made a little ambiguous by the presence of the fact that you can have slightly different features for OH and water and ice. And so with that in mind, uh, even the early detection has been sort of challenged at some level. And very recently, the SOFIA observatory, which actually observed uh, at six microns, direct signature of water, presence of water on the moon using this airborne observatory, uh, was able to make a direct detection of the fact that you know, uh, ice is actually directly detected from spectroscopic signatures. On Chandrayaan 2, we proceeded with actually covering, extending this band from three microns to five microns with, with two intentions in mind. <coughs> Sorry. One was to really look at uh, the complete spectral feature. And second, of course, to really uh, have uh, a, a section of the spectrum that would allow us to do proper thermal correction, which is critical for modeling the continuum emission infrared. Uh, so with that, I think the instrument that we have on board is very useful. So these three, Instruments are present right now in Chandrayaan 2, a, a dual frequency SAR, um, an extended infrared spectrometer, all, and also a mass spectrometer that is also there in Chandrayaan 1. But we have another one here, which actually would, could last quite some time because this, is, this will be on the orbiter. Earlier one was on a descent ballistic, uh, a descent uh, module that only had a few orbits to actually make measurements. Uh, but as we often know, these are the mass spectrometer measurements are challenging uh, because of various outgassing issues that one has to address. But we hope we should be able to, using the three instruments, make a meaningful summary on the question of water on the moon. Here is a, a spectrum from our current mission that actually shows clearly as we extend going into three microns, we actually see this dip, which is suggesting the presence of water signature. In addition to some of these, we also notice that every time we have the, the X-ray spectrometer going around the moon, um, once a lunar month, we actually see an enhanced radiation whenever the geotail, uh, the spacecraft passes through a geotail, which lasts about six days or so. And that's a very interesting uh, uh, signature and interesting thing to study because of the fact that this is not steady, as you can see here on different passages, the strength of the signal varies. These are important because when you look at the human presence on the surface of the moon, it is very important to both have a feel for the range of particle environment that would be present on the uh, surface of the moon and how much it varies 
uh, for with regard to safety of future human presence on the moon. And we of course have colleagues who are actually modeling this with regard to how uh, uh, Earth's field can be swept out and how disturbances can be measured uh, using both particles as well as other measurements, both from Earth and as well as from other vantage point at the moon. So that sort of summarizes quickly the discussion or the, the kind of activities we are currently pursuing with regard to uh, uh, lunar science. And I'd like to switch to astronomy and astrophysics program, which has been around uh, for quite some time because we began our space program with uh, um, early experiments. For example, the early experiment to look for gamma ray burst locations. This is a, during the time when gamma ray bursts were very elusive. Uh, this is a time when we didn't know where it came from, whether it was galactic, whether extra galactic. Um, and so the early efforts were always on triangulation, multiple spacecrafts detecting the same event, and then using the timing as a basis to really locate the event. So we had the initially a series of such experiments, then we matured into piggyback experiments that piggyback other, pair, other missions, on Earth observing missions, uh, which was a precursor for AstroSat, our large observatory currently in orbit. In, in between, we had small experiments to look at the solar flare uh, in X-rays and a similar one with the Russian photo coronas mission using certain new technologies. And finally, we currently have this an AstroSat mission which is dedicated to an astronomy observatory covering ultraviolet and uh, X-ray bands. This is sort of the cap drawing of that. It's easy to see. It has three large uh, proportional counters. These are very large. Proportional counter technology is not new, but these are fairly large ones, which means large collecting area. Large collecting area is very critical if you want to really do timing studies. Statistics has improved significantly when you have large, such a large uh, collecting area. And that is one of the key elements of the LAX PC experiment. In the center, you have two ultraviolet telescopes, which are operating on the far UV and near UV. And these are, uh, uh, these are, um, uh, they're, they're built with uh, colleagues from Canada as well. And uh, it has an angular resolution that is uh, about three to four times better than what the Galax mission had. And so very important uh, wide field, high angular resolution UV telescopes. We have a soft X-ray telescopes, which includes soft X-ray mirrors. For the first time, we're building these soft X-ray mirrors in India. Um, and that has been a very successful experiment with the CCD for looking at soft X-rays. And then uh, we moved into a, a hard X-ray telescope. Just excuse me for a minute. Um, that involves um, cadmium zinc telluride. So I'm saying compound semiconductors. First time you're working with them, but that actually allows us to look at uh, bright X-ray sources at uh, high, uh, hard X-rays. And a sky monitor that looks for transients in the sky. So that is the combination of systems we had. These are, is a picture of the two telescopes before integration, uh, UV telescopes, which demanded uh, severe uh, contamination control. As you can imagine, UV is very critical. Contamination is very critical in UV. And so we have to ensure a very, very clean environment, both for uh, assembly, testing, including onto the spacecraft. And that was a unique thing that uh, we had to uh, pursue for AstroSat uh, integration. And with that in mind, we actually uh, put, the, uh, put the telescope uh, uh, integrated and it was actually uh, put together. In 2015, we had a launch of the AstroSat mission. So this is the integrated satellite, the two UV telescopes here and the other paraphernalia all around it, which actually adds up to the full satellite, uh, make, have, making a, made up of all these uh, experiments. We also had a charged particle, particle monitor, primarily because as you can imagine, we, we launched this into a low Earth orbit. And the reason for a low Earth equatorial orbit, equatorial orbit because of the fact that we do not want a lot of charged particles uh, um, reducing the duty cycle of the satellite. And so, because then X-ray instruments are very poor, Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, so we carry a charged particle monitor, which is the input output of which is often used to control the switching on and switching off of payloads as it enters the South Atlantic anomaly where radiation levels are very high. Here's an image, one of the early images from this satellite uh, from the UVIT telescope showing the NGC 2336 
clearly the bright areas that you see are all uh, intense UV stars, you know, with star formation happening. And uh, just to do a comparison with galaxies, you can actually see these boxes that are not so clear. The galaxies are become very sharp with UV IT. So we really help uh, successfully manage to create a high resolution UV camera. And you, even after five years, what you found is the performance of the system is hardly degraded, which is a testament of the fact that the cleanliness control that we exercise on the ground has been exceptionally good. Some of the results here, this is a case of an emerging galaxy. What you see are there's two trailing arms arising from the, the, the galaxy merger uh, output. And what you see is this, uh, the bright spots are all from, from UV, um, new fresh stars being formed from this uh, shocked material. And uh, this is the Atom for Peace galaxy. This is the QL invisible image from HST. And uh, we are able to see, though not as good as that resolution, this is still at about 1.4 arc second resolution, but it allows us to really study various details, including the fact that certain parts of the, uh, some of these not show complete evacuation um, of gas, suggesting the presence of AGN activities in some of the cores of some of these uh, knots that we see in UV. And X-ray studies, because of the large area, as I mentioned, is exceptionally good to really do timing studies. Hercules X1, a well-studied source, often shows cyclotron features, it varies. And uh, the large area of, of black species allowed us to really study this in great detail. And uh, what we see is time dependence uh, in, the, in this change in the cyclotron feature, which not only tells us the magnetic field, but also tells us the change in the observed field or the derived field from that. And it, it appears, so the authors of the paper suggest that this is could arise from the fact that the material that's piling up near the polar cap is changing, and that is in turn influencing the field that you see. There have also been series of detections of QPOs, et cetera, at various uh, frequencies, in many sources, and monitoring these has become an important uh, output of uh, AstroSat. We have also a target of opportunity mode that allows any of you, including anyone in the world, to write to us um, on a particular alert that allows us to really then turn the spacecraft around. Uh, and if uh, the committee dis decides it's a, it's a useful thing to do, we then observe it for a day or two. And that data is made available almost immediately. So I would urge all of you, anyone interested in pursuing that, should really utilize the target of opportunity uh, option of AstroSet. It's been five years in running, and we have this open call for proposals on a yearly basis, which are for predefined proposals. And the data uh, from previous ones are all available in the Indian Space Science Data Center. As you can see, we have a fairly large, uh, nearly 50% of the data users are from around the world. And uh, that's quite satisfying and really good to know. And we hope this is a growing phenomenon in Indian space sciences. Now, when you look at, in, so in astronomy, let me, if you were to look in terms of future missions, um, we currently have uh, a satellite called ExpoSat, which is actually primarily focusing on X-ray polarimetry. And as you know, polarimetry is something that has not been uh, the focus in science for, for some strange reason. Um, you know, 45 years uh, ago, they had the last set of uh, polarimeters in space and then it looks like uh, scientists around the world have been having a hard time trying to sell that polarimetry is very critical to do pursue science. But today we're making a comeback and um, Astro ExpoSat carries one of the first of such missions. Uh, there's an experiment called POLIX, which is a uh, Thomson scattering polarimeter. It also carries a spectrometer that is uh, primarily to do spectral measurements at soft X-rays. Uh, it goes into a 650 kilometer circular orbit that, uh, and it's a spinning satellite to really make sure that we have uh, the modulation that you expect from polarization uh, is not arising from an artifact between the uh, fact that different detectors respond differently. So just a quick summary, it covers the 8 to 30 keV band. Uh, it, has a, it is a collimator based field of view, three by three degree collimator, but it has, um, and in order to make sure that the rotation does not modulate, uh, slight mis mis misalignment doesn't modulate the light curve, we have created a flat top uh, response multi collimator and it's a position sensing proportion counter. So what you see here is this is the collimator as a photon comes down, hits a scatterer at the center and then it moves into the four directions and you look at the azimuthal distribution and its modulation. And if you see a clean modulation, uh, it suggests the presence of linear polarization and that's how we 
we intend to detect polarization. This is of course not a very sensitive detector. It has about the current capacity that we see is about 3% minimum detectable polarization for a 40 uh, millicrab, a thousand of the crab, ne crab nebulous strength uh, over a uh, exposure term of 1.5 million seconds. And of course it addresses primarily when you talk about polarization, you're talking about mechanisms that involve uh, uh, magnetic fields and uh, processes that are distinctly polarized and whose uh, beam structure can be derived from the polarization information. And uh, so that is the primary thing for bright sources, about 50 bright sources and the primary source catalog and faint sources, but if they do get bright, we have again a target of opportunity mode. We may decide to then stare at these uh, bright outbursts, again, from the perspective of looking for in principle polarization of magnetars with the highly magnetized systems. There is indeed a, a mission IXPE coming from the US in 2021, but these are complementary parts of the energy spectrum. Polix uh, covers uh, the, hard, the higher energy part of it, whereas IXPE covers from two to eight keV. So we believe this would be very interesting to really compare the data from all of this. IXP, of course, is much more sensitive as uh, the most more advanced instrument. It can go down to 1% polarization at one milligram. But at least for the bright ones, we should be able to compare notes and really put down the broadband polarimetric response of uh, performance of uh, or behavior of certain cosmic sources. A second mission that we are anticipating very quickly in 21 is Aditya L1. It's a dedicated uh, solar mission for India um, to be positioned at Lagrange point one, uh, primarily looking at the dynamical events in the, um, in the atmospheres and of, of, of the sun. And uh, both active and uh, quiet phase are important. Uh, we have carry a set of um, detectors that are important for flare studies, for CME studies, and also looking at the byproducts of these in terms of particles and fields by doing measurements of these at, in C2 at L1. Um, and that is the overall objective of that. It is, has about seven payloads on board. There's a coronagraph. We began with the coronagraph and then later uh, augmented it with these other six instruments. The coronagraph has is unique with the perspective of trying to go very close to the surface of the disk of the sun. Clearly, as you can all imagine, that is a challenge technology wise. Um, and uh, it's, it continues to be a challenge even for us so to really control scattering and alignment and uh, stability of pointing, all these are critical. But our goal is to really go down to 1.05 was our design target, but at least at 1.08, we believe we should be able to do it, which is really excellent for looking at the early evolution of a CLE and deriving the, the, the velocity and acceleration parameters of an early CLE. Uh, which is very critical with regard to looking at uh, uh, space weather alerts that uh, everyone globally is interested in. The SUIT instrument is uh, primarily studying the full uh, contextually providing information of the photospheric activities and chromospheric activities using a set of filters. And uh, uh, that's, um, that provides the context information and the two uh, X-ray instruments study flares during uh, the soft X-ray as well as hard X-rays both are Sun as a star uh, instruments, they do not do imaging and hence integrates uh, total flux from the sun. And the in-situ instruments include particles for solar wind and uh, also for magnetic field measurements. And so that sort of roughly indicates the kind of, uh, we're looking at the disk very close to the edge of the sun and looking at how these uh, um, events in particular CMEs and flares are can be tracked as we go along, uh, as we continue to do this imaging along with the uh, X-ray instruments that tells us about the evolution of the X-ray emission. Um, this is just a spectrum that shows the fluence uh, from particles, from fluence from the flare that shows the enormous brightness that you'd expect to see from um, at soft X-ray. So one of the challenges of soft X-ray telescope was to really make sure we don't saturate the detectors during extremes of, uh, of uh, flares, you know, which go from um, sub A all the way up to X class flares. And there is an onboard uh, spectropolarimeter that actually does multi slit imaging as well. This is on the particle side of it. The two experiments cover different parts of the um, 
energy spectrum of particles, uh, part by an aspect payloads, and the magnetic field uh, is clearly mapping that is a clearly an important indication of the presence of shocks, uh, propagating shocks, and that we hope alongside other data should be able to allow us to put a picture together regarding uh, both uh, propagation uh, as well as uh, uh, intrinsic properties at L1, which can be compared with other experiments that were also present at L1. Looking beyond uh, these two missions, we've been actually looking at, uh, as we have sought inputs from our colleagues in the community on, uh, on future space areas of interest. Uh, this included, um, so there was a call for proposals from, to the Indian community about two years ago, and they have responded and we've actually then gone through it to discuss various things, review various things, and currently come up with a short list that are, are under consideration right now. One of the first ones is an ultraviolet mission. This builds on our current UV mission on AstroSat. That was an imaging telescope. There's a lot of interest in doing spectroscopy, and so the idea was to actually include spectroscopy and improve imaging by an order of magnitude. So this is again going to be a collaboration as we currently see uh, with our Canadian colleagues in putting together a UV spectroscopy mission where the UV imaging is, we're trying to push down to a tenth of a, uh, or two tenths of an arc second. Uh, that's really challenging, uh, but um, um, the prognosis looks very good with regard to achieving it from the current design that's being displayed to us. We are also entering into this exoplanet studies. Uh, there's a group uh, interested in looking at exoplanets, clearly a very important area of astronomy that has emerged in recent times. And that is uh, specifically not looking at detecting them, but rather looking at a spectroscopy of the atmospheres of exoplanets uh, using the features of absorption that you'll see in the uh, host star spectrum. Of course, these are faint, it demands a very accurate spectro uh, photometric accuracy of these instruments. And so we need large optics and the optics uh, is large. And that of course makes the whole mission very challenging. Um, so we're now converging on the size of the optics and uh, looking at the uh, feasibility of actually trying to put this into our largest rocket that can actually take it out. Uh, but that's an emerging area that we're looking at with a lot of expectation. The recent discovery of gravitational waves from merging merged events the last few years has actually um, driven us to really look at counterparts for these things. And one of the current problems in gravitational wave events is that is trying to derive the error box. And uh, so one possible way to look for this is to look for X-ray uh, prompt emission from such events. And that would again demand, just as we had during the gravitational, during the gamma ray burst phenomena, a need for all sky um, observing capability in X-rays. So this mission that has been proposed includes two, two satellites that will ensure at no time is any one of them occulted by this Earth uh, while um, an event actually goes off. So, but it requires a quick and early development. It requires uh, early download of data, etc. But that's an interesting um, proposal that has also been considered. There's also a lot of interest in the epoch of reionization signatures from the cosmic dawn phase, um, the 21 centimeter line emission that is redshifted down to the discovery or the, the few papers that have come out on the 78 megahertz signature is being is to be looked at in much more detail. There is a group here that's been studying this and they've been doing a lot of ground experiments. And now it's believed what would be very useful is to actually have such an experiment, not around earth, but around the moon, because the moon would the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon is an excellent place that actually um, completely absorbs or lies mostly uh, the, say the signatures of uh, RFI, radio frequency interference from Earth. FM channels are a, are a deadly thing to handle. And so with nearly 80 dB reduction in intensity, the far side of the moon is a great place to do. Of course, that's a challenge. We need to then build a mission that actually goes to the moon, but that is also undergoing a lot of discussion and development. Finally, there is a, certainly a, a desire to build on X-ray astronomy uh, beyond AstroSat, and that is uh, the interest of this in broadband polarimetry, building from where we leave off with the, with the near-term mission Polix, ExpoSat, but building a more sensitive 
broadband polarimetric machine that goes from soft X-rays to hard X-rays. Of course, it involves again development of optics, not just for soft X-ray optics, but for hard X-ray optics. Some effort is underway, but these are all challenges that the community needs to address rather quickly. If you look quickly at the planetary exploration programs, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a, a lunar mission that is now undergoing a phase A study jointly with our colleagues in Japan. Uh, so ISRO and JAXA have a joint program. Uh, this involves a South Pole landing mission um, and uh, primarily look for uh, really getting to one of the permanent shadow regions of the, of the, at the pole and uh, to look for what lies in related matter, related science. Uh, now, it's quite challenging to do this, uh, given the fact that we do not carry, we will not be carrying a RTG or a nuclear powered system for, 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 for power. We are still rely on solar power, which means landing at a place where the sun is still visible for many months. And there are such locations that imposes severe constraints on where we can land and how we can land. Uh, but that is uh, challenging, and so there are some payloads and considerations, includes ground penetrating radars, spectroscopy uh, in infrared and X-rays, maybe a Raman and spectrometer, mass spectroscopy, as well as neutron spectroscopy, have all been considered. Uh, so it's a sharing between the two agencies, and currently we are at the, uh, looking at a phase A study. Uh, and so next year we should be able to see if we can take it forward with regard to the next phase of. Uh, maturity of the mission. For a new program that we are now initiating is a mission to Venus. Um, again, about two years ago, a uh, little less than two years ago, uh, we had a call for proposals from globally on for, for a Venus mission opportunity in June 23. Uh, we had uh, proposals on this both within the country and outside. Um, and we've gone ahead and actually worked out a lot of these details. However, as with many programs, our, uh, with this year, 2020, being a real washout with regard to the ability to do many things, we may be forced to uh, re-examine another window because this is quite tight. And the next window that comes up is in December 24. And that may require, may have other penalties with regard to payload capacity and so on. So currently, we are examining the next windows, but clearly it's a mission of high priority for us. We are looking at, you know, scientifically going to really look at uh, Venus as a poorly studied object. Um, uh, we really want to look at both surface processors um, as well as a little bit of subsurface using, again, long wavelength uh, radar, radars to really map the surface uh, using the S-band uh, better than what Magellan did. And then, of course, uh, the atmosphere, its composition, structure, and uh, dynamics, clouds, and the uh, Super rotation of, the, of, of clouds, composition of clouds, variability of sulfur dioxide. Is it linked to volcanic activity? These are all important questions to be answered. And of course, an important thing that I think Dimitra is also very keen is in terms of looking at solar wind interaction with the um, um, which is very important to understand how a host star influences the planet's atmosphere, the tension of water and so on. So these are, this is a combination of various things being looked into. We hope we will be able to get going on this very quickly. And that uh, lays out an important country exploration program of ours. I think that's all I had. And I hope I've taken 40 minutes. Hope that should be fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I am clapping on behalf of the audience. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Uh, so we are open to questions. Uh, please okay. use the Q and A feature or uh, raise your hand, and I will unmute your microphone. I just had a question that you mentioned that ISRO is now also involved with astrobiology or space biology kind of science. So, are there what kind of missions uh, are you planning along those lines? Yeah, um, we don't have a big program right now, and uh, partly. The interest in astrobiology has come from two sides. One from a planetary exploration perspective, as we are now looking at uh, uh, descent and surface operation uh, missions, where you're looking at actually being on the surface and doing exploration on the surface. 
uh, in particular for Mars, uh, the second mission to Mars might have such a component. It's very important that we start looking at astrobiology as a very important area for investigation. We have a community here that's been studying astrobiology in the context of extreme environments in the country, you know, uh, and they would naturally evolve to really be players in this. And the second area that has pushed us into that is actually the fact that we're going to have this human space program that demands, uh, that in makes it interesting to really look at how uh, life forms uh, survive in space, uh, exterior and interior spacecrafts, uh, health of humans is critical and so on. So these are new areas that are coming up and the modality in which we're now addressing it right now is through small experiments that would actually go through, uh, become part of our uh, early launch test launches that we have for the human mission, which will actually carry some of these experiments. So we have passive experiments that could be like a fruit fly experiments, a few other things that have been carried that comes back and scientists study pre and post scenarios and interesting. As the program moves, we anticipate this to become a very active area of interest. And clearly today, exoplanet, you know, ultimate objective in exoplanet science that everybody is interested in often is to ask for life and life related matters. And so we believe this is an area that will actually grow and needs to be encouraged and they should intend to do that. All right, great. Yeah, we have uh, another question. Yeah, uh, what has been the progress with the human space program or life support systems being designed and built? Yeah, I, I don't work a lot with them, but certainly they have been done. And then, you know, we have a, a short window to really demonstrate uh, um, um, or, or have our first uh, Indian in space. And so all the related things are proceeding very well. Um, and a, a small hiccups could, would certainly be impacted, will be there because of this COVID impact, but then otherwise think people are, and systems are working very hard towards meeting that uh, goal. Thanks. Srini, do you have any question? Um, no, I don't. Um, I'm very sorry I joined you late. Oh, I, I would like you. to uh, uh, look at the the talk and then I will write you any questions. Sure. No problem. Yeah. All this uh, time difference just screwed me up, even though it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like there is another question. Data Actually, I'll let you. Uh... Okay, I see. First, I see a. Person. I meant Aditya. It was my spell check. I didn't no problem. Right. understand Aditya. Yes, yes, is the data yes, yes. publicly available? Yes, yes, excellent. Yes, certainly. Uh, what Thank we you. we do have a, a one year nominal time for the payload team's proprietary access to the data. And then that goes public, and uh, I, uh, there is even a short window of uh, of target of opportunity or possibilities. We do not know whether we will kickstart that from day one or maybe after a year. But that also allows uh, interesting, uh, timely interventions or observations that others can participate in, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I see a question from my three, Paul. What are some of the potential challenges for these missions? I do not know when, what you mean by these missions. Challenges are always there. As we see it as space scientists here, we find the biggest challenge is making the payloads <laughs> and making them to the specs that you desire and making, making sure they are calibrated and uh, systems are in place when the, when the missions are up and we are ready to quickly do science with it. This has not been easy, but as we do each one, we find that uh, an early preparedness of all of this helps. Uh, and when you go to new areas like Venus, etc., there are many technology issues that have to be addressed, thermal um, and of course, orbit control and insertion are all challenges. And the further you go, we have all these problems and um, and then, of course, uh, data download. As we build more sophisticated instruments, the data volume goes up, uh, but then the ability to bring it down uh, is not as good as we'd like it to be. And so we have to have a lot of onboard intelligence built in. And this is an area that also requires a lot of focus and effort, yeah. All right, so if there are no more questions, then let us uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sleekman. It was a Thank wonderful you. presentation and uh, yeah, it was great to see ISRO's uh, intermissions. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Bye-bye.
All right. See you all next week.